Good morning, everyone. Um, so, I mean, Colosa and me, we've been uh, hosting the discussion. And, you know, I mean, in this session, we're talking about the post COVID education. And it seems like, I mean, we talk about the post COVID education uh, quite often now. So, the people will have the preference to go to something a bit more specific. But in, uh, in, in this session, I think, I mean, we can share our story, our experience. I mean, when we're coping with the COVID uh, in the last, I mean, two years and the lesson we learned and I mean, how can we prepare for, for, for the futures. And I'm pretty sure that some of the discussion in this session, we have a very close link to other session as well. For example, like when we talk about the innovation for the preschool education, we, we can see that for the early childhood education, it is heavily uh, affected during the COVID-19, most of the preschool school in, in Vietnam have been closed for more than two, I mean, more than one year. And many schools have been I mean, uh, uh, closed after that. And a big number of the preschool teacher will not come back to, to the career again after, after the school opening. So we can see a lot of problems. In the session three, we talk about the innovation on the distant learning. And I'm pretty sure when we talk about the lesson learned in the future application, we will touch on that as well. So, I mean, I, I just want to say, I mean, maybe we either can talk on one of the four topics that mentioned in other section, or we can we talk more in a policy approach, if you'll be very, very open. So I before we can, uh, I mean, invite other participants from, uh, from, from, the, uh, from the round table discussion to share the experience, uh, maybe Colosa, uh, you want to say something and uh, share about the South Africa uh, story, and then I can share about Vietnam story, and then we will invite the other, I mean, to contribute, and then we can drawing some, I mean, the conclusion from the from this uh, round table. Colosa. Thank you, Anne. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining our round table discussion. Um, my name is Colosa. I work for the Department of Basic Education in Pretoria, South Africa in the Research Monitoring and Evaluation Unit. Um, and my job as Assistant Director is um, basically focused on early, on early grade reading um, in South Africa, um, but especially with a, with a view to of, um, quintile one to three schools, and those schools are Social economically, um, the on the lower on, on the lower edge of the spectrum. Um, so what we'll be discussing is the post-COVID purpose and priorities, and how um, the approaches in South Africa have have um, how approaches that South Africa over the past two years have been implemented in government. Um, I also want to share this in light with the Salzburg um, breadth of skills approach. Um, in terms of the cognitive, creative, physical, and social uh, well-being of the learners, and how the approaches that we use in early grade. Um, Apologies, I'm going to jump in. Uh, I think I was still speaking. Yes, would you like make <laughs> Yes, please, please continue. Um, <laughs> Um, I just wanted to um, just let the participants know some of the key questions that uh, my group and I had posed to each other um, last year regarding post-education purpose and priorities. Um, and the first one is, what will be the new, fund new fundamentals for students to afford the challenges to quality education? And the second one is, should the role of teachers and parents change to strengthen um, education? Those are the some of the questions that we as a group thought through in terms of education, um, post-COVID um, purposes and priorities. Thank you. Okay, so thank you, uh, Colosa. Yeah, so let me, I mean, follow up with uh, with that by sharing something, I mean, from, from Vietnam. So. I mean, then, then we can invite you to join and contribute from the story. So Vietnam is quite, I mean, uh, a bit different story because we are very close, to, I mean, kind of next to China. And uh, from the beginning, we follow one of the very strict, I mean, 
uh, way to coping with the COVID. We follow the approach zero COVID. It means like we we control from the beginning, make sure there is no, uh, I mean the the, uh, the the infected case are in the communities. When we finding out, I mean the app zero, and we didn't, they will be put on the quarantines and very strict at the beginnings. And actually, we we get some uh, very success for the first years and the first half of the second years. We keep the number of the case be minimums and evens. We have something like five five months or something in the big city. There's no case at all. I mean, I'm I'm, I'm located in Hanoi, the capital of uh, Vietnam. But I mean, during for the extended periods, we almost feel I mean, there's no COVID at all. So I mean, it's it's quite I mean, a successful approach at the beginning until until the Delta variants <laughs> I mean. Uh, appears right and things change and then we cannot follow the zero covid approach anymore now we slowly i mean openings and with the help from the vaccine uh, strategy of the government we cover i mean 90 percent or something i mean for the adults and very high percents of the kids from the grade 7 to grade 12 has been vaccinated so it and we are expecting to open the school again. I mean, in after the long break, uh, it will be maybe seven of February. Okay, so it is at the start. And let me explain to you what happened to Vietnam education and the school at the beginning. At, at the at first, I mean, the government is very skeptical. So we open. I mean, we only can open the school only for one week after the break in the last two years. The same like this time, around this time, when we have the first case, we have a long break. After that, we open school for one week and then we close again and close for two months. Even at that time, there's only few cases in, in Vietnam. And uh, the Ministry of Education and Training has been very proactive. The issues, I mean, many policies go to the province level, putting the situation on the top priorities. We cut down, uh, we make the modification to the curriculum to make it into the core, the core uh, contents. Uh, all of the television broadcasts has joining uh, to supporting for the education. Uh, 28 television broadcasts has a uh, signed agreement to support that they broadcasting the on on the TVs, and we provide with the kids from the primary uh, school with the TV program so they can have the access for, for that. For the older group of the, of the student, we very quickly move from offline to the online mode. But we have to say, I mean, uh, it's only the alternative uh, solution. So after the first lockdown, it is uh, until the April 2020, we open the school again. We open the school again and there's no big uh, serious problem for the first semester, for the first semester of the school year 2020, 2021. And after, I mean, the, the third holiday again, and that, I mean, some of the, some of the city, they have to close the school again. And the things become bad in the last six months, in the last six months, after the April 30, after the April 30, uh, the same time with the Delta variants, the case jumping quickly in, in, in Vietnam and then we have to close, close it and the kids stay at home from April 13 until now. It is a, a lot of discussion, the big discussion and we all understand, I mean, from the, the beginning, we want to keep the kids safe. But now, I mean, we find out that we cannot keep them stay in, in, at home anymore. There are a few things that I, I want to rise up and maybe want to get the, the inside the thought and sharing experience. Uh, it seems like if you need to close something, the school should be the last one we close and it should be the first thing we open. But what happened in practice is just opposite. The school will be the first one that we close and it will be the last things that we even open. It is what happened in, in Vietnam. Because we always think like, okay, we can find a safe way, I mean, there's a safe solution for the kids. So now even we open all of the office, all of the restaurant, all, all of the service, but we still keep the, the school closed. 
because we I mean have a high worry, a lot of pressure for the ministry's office, for the province uh, governments to decide whether they can open it or not and how we can, they can control the situation. It is the, the first thing that we, we want to mention. The second point is we can fight, I mean, the uh, what I can say, the device gap is very huge. I mean, in, in, in that we, in the perfect uh, situation, in the normal situation, there's there's a gap between the advantage and disadvantage group from the urban and rural areas. But things happen and we can see the gap even wider. So how we can close that in, 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 in our government, we promote one of the campaign. It is calling the device for the student, one device for one student. And a lot of donation has uh, joined in uh, the big company, and tech company, they own joy, try to bring in the device for, for, for the student, but it's not that uh, own because I mean, not only the divide, we need a lot of other things. The third question I, I want to bring in is, we talk about the ethic for a very long time, you know? Uh, sure, I mean, in, in all of the country, we talk about the ethic, it seems like uh, very challenging things, I mean, in the last 10 years, but it doesn't happen much actually, I mean, before the COVID in Vietnam, but the two years of the COVID, things totally change. So it seems like the education system is always considered as a very slow to adapt to the new thing, very slow to reform. It can be, it can be reformed and it can be ready for the new model. It can be ready for the new model. The, the point is how, I mean, what is the motivation? What is the pressure for the system to change, right? And we can see the COVID is one kind of the pressure to push the education system to change and it really can change. I don't know the situation in other countries, but when we talk about the education reform, everyone is saying, no, we don't believe it because it will be the hardest reform that we can make. We have been very successful in the economic reform, but the, the thing is not that easy for education reform. But the COVID can teach us one of the lessons is, I mean, we can change and actually it, it, can, it can happen. Uh, the fourth thing that I want to share from the Vietnam experience is we are quite skeptical for the online learning. We are very, very skeptical for the online learning, actually. We don't accept the fully online learning mode, even for higher education. So before the COVID, there's no component for the general education can be conducted online. And for the university, it is very limited. And after the first year, on September 2020, we have the first decrease to allow the maximum of 15% of the content can be can be delivered uh, online for the primary uh, for the general education, and for higher education it can be up to 30%. And I expect that in this year, I mean, things will be easier for 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 this guy, and we will slowly accepting for the online. I mean, the fully online mode for higher education, and then we can bring in also for, for, for the primary. And the fifth point, the fifth point that we will we also find out is, it is the big pressure, big stressful for the parents also, especially for the parents of the younger kids. It is, I mean, shifting from something like the class teaching to the homeschooling teaching or something. So the parents have been involved too much on, on that. And it has been a, 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 a big problems and many sad story happened. I mean, recently when they have some kind of the psychology problems and uh, uh, children, uh, child abuse and, and, and so on. It's also rising the, 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 the situation that we, we want to mention. Yeah, so I, I just want to stop here when we mentioned about the few things that I observed and want to rise up and invite you to share the the, the story from, from the country. Uh, I don't want to go in, I mean, into too detailed technical solution that the education ministries or education office has been, has done to, I mean, to, to uh, support the situation because I believe most of the country will do the same. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So maybe we open for, I mean, uh, the discussion. Kolosha, you want to follow up? Thanks, Lynn. Um, just listening to your presentation, I picked up a few similarities 
um, that were also adopted here in South Africa in terms of schooling during um, the pandemic. You mentioned a, mod a modified curriculum. We also implemented that and uh, we called a trimmed curriculum that allowed teachers to catch their learners up, so to speak, in terms of the learning losses experience. And this was also mainly because we also we adopted um, in many of the public schools a rotational attendance of schooling where learners would rotate either weekly or every second day in order to observe COVID protocols because in some of the schools that I, I spoke about that we work in, it is schools that have very large classrooms, which means that there would be no um, space for social distancing and that would also encourage the spread of COVID in, 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 in the classroom. So that is still something that's still being implemented by some schools in South Africa ever since schools reopened in 2020. And also the use of technology, uh, I'm glad that you mentioned it because what we face in terms of our context here is that technology, it, the use of stable and consistent technology is only available to a select few um, of um, citizens in the country. So that was not very feasible for a lot of um, the, 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 the poorer areas where, where, where learners um, needed to learn during the, 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 the lockdown. And this led to a lot, uh, about 70% um, of learning losses in South Africa as reported um, by a, a, an impact study that ha was, ha was started in 2020. Um, so I think you're right in that COVID did teach, teach, teach us that um, change is possible. But I think one of the questions, I think for the new fundamentals um, so forth, um, learners' quality education is that um, change is possible for only, uh, I think, a select group of individuals in the context that we live in, because there's also been talk of um, a new online school permanently um, in South Africa, but that is not available to a lot of our foundation phase learners aged 3 to 12 in the country. So then it automatically cuts off a large part of the population. Um, so yeah, I think also just to um, highlight our context in the in, 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 in the context of South Africa and the Salzburg spread of skills learning, what I found interesting when I looked at um, the holistic skills approach um, and particularly looking at cognitive skills approach because um, that's what we've been working with a lot in terms of the early grade reading study where it's, where, where it's a project to encourage um, learners to be able to read for meaning by the age of 10 through the training and coaching of teachers and the provision of learning and teaching materials um, in schools in two provinces, in Palestine and two provinces in South Africa. And we continued um, this piloting during, um, I mean, after, after the announcement of COVID as teachers went back to school because there were some successes of this um, of this program even before COVID, and I think what we're seeing is that there are a lot of cognitive skills that still need to be developed by learners. I'm just looking at my slides. So if I'm looking at the slide, um, I think cognitive skills um, such as the speed of information processing, sustained attention, working memory, a lot of skills that I have found that teachers say that they struggle with learners a lot who have been away from school and who attend schools in school in rotation is that learners don't seem to have sustained memories. Learners seem to have forgotten a lot of the foundational things that were taught. Now, this is in grades one to three, which means that if we don't get this right, as you know, that the, the rest of their learning and um, work um, career uh, hangs, hangs in, 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 in hangs in um, is vulnerable in terms of how they grow up and, and how they enter the working world. So I think post-COVID priorities should include encouraging um, schools, schools reopening, which they have in South Africa, but also encouraging learner high learner attendance um, so that we can have more learners in the classroom um, to assist um, learning recovery. But I also think 
there is a need for um, households to be looked at in terms of um, social protections and how things are in the in the home, um, and that things and and that um, to take into um, I think mind the fact that there's been a lot of job losses, there's been a lot of um, psychosocial impact um, before the pandemic, but um, much more so during the pandemic. And those I think are some of the things that should be prioritized um, moving forward in a post pandemic world. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Colossus. Uh, so other participants, do you want to share the story and the insight on, on that? Catherine, I, I saw you smiling, right? <laughs> I mean, I, I work for the Lego Foundation, so I don't really have the same sort of stories to, to tell about reform that, that you guys do. And it's really interesting to, to hear your reflections. My, I guess I've got a couple of questions that are kind of around like the sort of appetite within policy, you know, I mean, you guys are members of the policymakers network. So that, you know, that obviously means that you're like really engaged and really like up for reform and like, give me some new ideas and how do I, you know, how do I make change? And I just would be really interested to hear like, when you're having these conversations about, okay, how are we gonna respond to the latest challenge, you know? Are you, are you having the doors open? Are you, you know, are you having to, you know, are the conversations about how do we continue to deliver what we were delivering, but in a different way? Or are you able to like introduce, well, while we're doing this differently, can we think differently about other things? Or are you feeling, you know, that sort of the, the system is saying, no, no, we just have to do the basics and do them as well as we can. Like, what, what, how are you feeling about those kind of conversations? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so let, let me reflect uh, on, on, on what happened in, in, in in Vietnam. So at, at the beginning, I mean, the, 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 the natural re reaction is we just want to cope with that and wait for it over. It will be very natural, right? I mean, and, and it's the way we do. You know, I mean, at the beginnings, when we observe it in the first month, the school just be very skeptical. They, they think it will go over soon. There's some kind of the homework base and, and, and so on. And then we want to try to move everything from the offline to the online, the same schedule, everything. The mm. teacher even, even try to do exactly the same thing. They copy everything that they can provide for the student. And okay, we, we, don't, we don't, I mean, have no doubt that it will, it will fail, right? And it will be a lot of pressure for, for, for the kids. And then they change it from seven sessions per day to five sessions per day and so on. And then, the school reopen. The kids come back to their to their class. And what happened for that? The the point is whether the teacher changes, whether the school changes, do they learn anything good from what happened? It is the, the, the thing that we want to see. You know, many of the teachers before the COVID happened, before that, they never use any kind of the technology application in the classroom, right? And during that, they learn a lot of. I mean, they learn many new skills, they mm. become the change uh, maker and, and so on. But when the, they come back to the no offline situation, what do you see, right? Some of the teachers, they still keep what they learn. They still, they still keep the innovation, the innovative way that they learned. But I, I think it will be kind of the revolution. I mean, the, the, the process, it will happen again and again and again, and it, it makes Thing changes, and we can see very clear, very clear that uh, besides of I mean the bad impact, we see some of the positive uh, 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 things as well. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I think from my side, just to add to the discussion, I don't 
know if I have a definitive answer, but I think COVID has demanded um, us to respond to these challenges and not to just sit in the traditional way that things have been done. Um, I think the introduction of, of, of practices such as rotational learning has also been met with um, some really um, appreciation from teachers where they were like the classes before were too big and they were mm. unable to give um, dedicated attention to individual learners so they were finding an ease they were finding this as an as, 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 a, as a positive way of sort of easing back into into the learning and to that end um, one of our projects um, last year was also um, supplying extra reading materials to learners in schools that they could take home so that to ensure that during the times when they are not at school they are learning um, and I think this was also done by a lot of um, NGOs in South Africa, um, where they also su supported learning at home for um, especially those learners that don't have access to, to, to technology, whereas a book is something that they can use. We also provided um, what we call parent guides, which are interactive posters that can support reading um, in, the, in, in the home. So I think that some of the ways in which we've delivered um, or, or try to adjust um, learning in, in a different way when the teacher is not there um, to ensure that learners um, can learn in the home. Um, but I also think there is perhaps room for more collaboration between government and, and the civil and civil society in how this can be supported um, going forward because the learning losses are huge. Like I said, 70% um, and uh, a recent survey showed that it would take 10 years to recover some of these learning losses. So I think moving forward, we really need to look into um, collaborating and not feel that now that COVID, um, or now at, I don't know, here in South Africa, now that hard lockdown um, is, is over, that we can go back to normal, but we also need to continue with um, recovering le learning losses and not going back um, to normal and sort of seeing how we can make the most out of this new normal because it has consequences that will affect um, the children of, of the country and of mm -hmm. the world for, for, for decades to come. Thanks. Uh, somebody, I want to share something. Um, I wonder if I can perhaps yes. just um, contribute or, or, or support um, some of what um, Kulosa has said. Um, I'm, I'm also based in South Africa. I work for an NPO that does school and teacher development work across um, six of the nine provinces that, that our schools are based in. Um, and, and I really think you, the summary that you provided earlier really captures quite uh, uh, clearly and succinctly some of the, the gains, if I can put it that way, um, but also some of the serious challenges that we faced um, in, in South Africa. I, I think one of the things that seems to be a hot issue at the moment is, is the rotational timetable. Um, it, it varied across the country where in some areas learners were attending school every second day. So perhaps in those situations, teachers saw an ease because they got to see learners either on a Monday, Wednesday and Friday or a Tuesday and Thursday. And, and you know, that's how it rolled over. Um, I do. I mean, we work in, in um, under resourced schools. So we work in deep rural schools and in township schools where I mean, I've spoken to teachers um, just recently who teach grade eight um, and, and the teacher said to me, I will see my learners once every two weeks because she normally has a class of 60. So there's a huge challenge and I know there's currently, um, Kolosa will know this, there's, there's currently a huge it's referred to as a lechotla in, in South Africa. Uh, yeah, I don't know what the equivalent um, English term is for that. It's not really a conference, but it's a kind of a large thinking, thinking space for people in education. And the, the issue of rotational timetabling has really come to the fore 
there are lots of challenges. Some people argue there's a political there's a political dynamic that underlies some of the battles around that. Others are saying, you know, there's a medical challenge around that. You've got the vaxxers, the anti-vaxxers, the people who believe in social distancing, people who don't. So I, I think I think what COVID has done is it's forced us all to realize how interconnected just about everything and anything is. So for us to think we can talk education and schooling without talking health, without talking economy, without talking social support and development, we really are fooling ourselves. Um, and one of the one of the challenges I think we sit with, and and I don't I can't really say that this is a global challenge necessarily. So I can really only speak for South Africa. I I've been thinking a lot about how much we've lost through COVID, um, but also how much we've gained. And just yesterday I had a conversation with someone and I said to her, I wish I could um, kind of, yeah, I'm not a social media um, fanatic, but you know, when people talk about creating hashtags and all of that kind of thing. And, and I suppose my new little hashtag is don't stop what you started. And I'm, I'm wondering about encouraging people to focus on the positive things that they started doing during COVID. And, and the two examples, uh, just listening to Colosa and some of my thinking in my conversation yesterday, the one for me, one example is collaboration. I think it really has um, escalated quite positively in the last two years. And the second is um, parent and learner um, investment in education. I think parents have been forced, they may not always have liked it, but parents were forced to become more involved in their children's education, whether they were literate or illiterate, poor or rich, uh, wherever they lived, they were forced to in some way invest themselves in education. And there's a part of me that's sort of wanting to say, where we've done positive things, where, where we've had gains, let us not now sit back and say, okay, COVID's gone, so we can leave the kids to the teachers now and we don't have to monitor homework and we don't have to check um, and supervise what our kids are doing in the afternoons. Um, and I wonder whether some kind of advocacy, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't like the phrase advocacy, advocacy campaign, but some kind of reminder that goes out nationally to say to to parents, to teachers, to learners, if you tried to do something more for your own learning and teaching and your children and your classroom uh, during COVID, just continue to do it now still. Um, don't let it, don't let go of it. Um, and, and, and that goes for all of us, all of us, even NPOs and NGOs, we've all turned a page, we've all tried to do something innovative and different and I'm just terrified that we're all just going to go, you know, when people say, oh, it's new normal. Actually, I feel like we, we run the risk of people going back to normal and the old normal was not okay. So, so that's kind of what I'm sitting with um, on a personal level and otherwise. And, and maybe my last reflection for now is around the, the way in which social emotional learning has has gained so much impetus across the globe. We've never had people in education speaking about emotional well-being and emotional intelligence in the way they have in the last year and a half. I'm a psychologist by profession. I'm an educational psychologist. I've been trying to do this kind of work for the last 25 years. And suddenly everybody was talking the same language as me. And I'm I'm, I'd be so saddened if suddenly that fell off the agenda. Um, so that's that's kind of my my two pennies worth for now. Um, but thanks, Kuloza, for really sketching a a very a very accurate um, and and critically reflective um, picture of what's happening in our country. So yeah, thanks for the opportunity. I'd be interested to hear if you think there's any like political drivers that are needed to kind of, you know, you're talking about kind of an advocacy 
campaign, which, you know, I guess is, is would be level that kind of parents, caregivers, teachers, like what is there that needs to be done at that kind of, you know, top level of government, you know, like, is there something that needs to be like a policy solution in terms of legislation, regulation, you know, something, I, I don't know, like, is that possible? Is that something that, you know, there's any sort of political space for, or are people just like, we have got so much to do, you know, that's just completely pie in the sky, to use a hackneyed English phrase. <laughs> Catherine, if I may, um... Yeah, I'm not a policy maker. I've never worked for government, so I can't. And I, I, I would really urge others who are in that space to, to, to respond. My, and Colosa, I'd be really keen. Please challenge me if you have a different perception. Um, South Africa is very good at developing policy and creating laws that are really, really good. I, I really, I mean, I say that as a very proud South African. I mean, I think many of you will know we probably have one of the best constitutions in the world. Um, we have a Bill of Human Rights and Responsibilities that's sterling. Um, in education, we have policies that talk to parent involvement through school governing bodies. We have policies that... Um, if I can use the word dictate, dictate to teachers, dictate to parents, dictate to district officials. Um, we've got hundreds, if not tens of thousands of policy documents that say this is the legislation, do this. A, a job description for a principal tells them what to do. But I work in schools where principals just don't do it. So I'm not convinced, and I'm speaking as an activist from a long, long time ago who fought for change at a political level and who I think I, yeah, I kind of, I'm not convinced that that law shifts, uh, shifts, shifts practice. Um, my my sadness in South Africa is that we're 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 good at developing policies, but we're very slow to implement policy. Um, and it's not just slow because people drag their feet. I think it's slow because there's often resistance. We have a democratic culture that is so democratic that we undo ourselves in the process. Um, so I, I don't have a, a, yeah, I mean, when you're saying, so we, so who, who must do this? Who must tell people to just do it? Um, I'm not convinced that, that a kind of political or policy level or legal level challenge uh, legislation is actually going to make a shift. Um, the bottom line is that it lies at the level of hearts and souls. And I was listening to someone talk about climate change in our in our world the other day. And sadly, the human species doesn't really make a lot of effort to look around you and just do something different. Our world is dying, but we drink out of plastic bottles and we toss them in the road and we litter wherever we choose to and we drive our cars and we don't carpool and, 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 and. Um, so as much as I love being a human being, I wouldn't be a cat or a dog. Um, but it saddens me that I've, I, yeah, I'm part of a species that is a bit, um, I don't know, um, I, I, feel, I feel like our conscience is slipping. Um, yeah, I'm sounding... A pessimistic or yeah but I'm, I'm not usually like this I'm just struggling to find solutions at the moment yeah but I don't think legislation is going to shift much because we have it in our country and Kuloza will I'm sure back me up on this gee we really have good legislation in South Africa we really do thanks Nadine yeah I, I agree with you that we have we have all the policies the, the programs I'm implementing right now um, are policy driven and we're working currently at implementation level. So to, um, to answer part of your question, Catherine, I'd say that there is political will in terms of where the government wants to focus. For instance, in terms of reading, when we discovered that um, children in South Africa 
are struggling to read for meaning by the age of 10, um, this, this project, um, among others, was, was started and is being spearheaded by the government and being piloted, like I said, in two provinces in South Africa. Um, however, I think um, since COVID, there's also been, um, I think, a division in terms of political world, whereas the different political, I'll, I'll say the different, different political parties all have different ideas on how to now approach education um, in, in the time of COVID and what to do in terms of moving forward. So as much as we, there is um, implementation of, of, of policies that have been there, I think now COVID has really put a spanner in the works where, where it is new for um, all the stakeholders involved and there's different, um, there's different opinions on how it should be handled. And I think it's also we're learning as we go, which is why I think collaboration is so important and not just um, within South Africa, but I think also globally to see what works in different countries and what hasn't um, worked in, in certain countries. Um, so yeah, I also think in terms of political will, for me, um, if, I, if, if, if I can be critical as someone who works in government, I feel like the, the t in, in terms of the allocation of resources and funds, um, we are working on, um, working um developing more resources for stem education whereas told learners still can't read for meaning by the age of 10 so then you wonder where what the political will like are we trying to 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 um I, I think have our fingers in different parts of the pie and then nothing works or we're not really focusing on the core issues um and then that goes back to um i think the different influences in government and i think the different um, priorities that, that that government has. But I, I will say that um, coming from a civil society background, I do think that um, there should be more co collaboration within government and other stakeholders um, that I believe in and different learnings that can be taken and transferred to different contexts but in order to meet, I think, the goal of, of, of learning, uh, especially in a post in the post-COVID um, world. Um, yeah, I don't really have answers, but those are just my thoughts. Um, but yeah, I think next I'd love to hear from the other participants or um, attendees of the meeting, how um, the how how COVID has changed um, purpose and priorities in education in, in other countries um, or in their context. If we could have that, um, there's a few minutes before, um, our our round table ends if there's any other thoughts. I myself um am not an educator, but my father is and he works within the school system. So perhaps I can share a um something that's kind of come up that I've seen through him that maybe you guys could share some light on. Um, but for him, I feel like I really see how much additional burden has been put on the educators themselves uh, without much extra resources, at least. We've been doing this also kind of rotational education where they're now teaching to in-person students, but also online um, and having to kind of facilitate both of those classroom environments at the same time, as well as with parents being extra kind of aggressive and also frustrated with the fact that they're having to be um, participating more in their education and also the fact that they're at home with them quite a bit. Um, Many of them, I think, I think it exacerbated problems that were already existing with um, educators being underpaid, as well as having a lack of resources and support from administrators. Um, and so I feel like these problems have been coming up. And I think they were also kind of on the forefront of this kind of masking debate that is often um, near in my area of uh, parents being reluctant to have their children wearing masks all the time. And this was also before the vaccine came out. Um, and so the I think the teachers felt quite uh, devalued because they were being asked to go into a situation with no one wearing masks and feeling like they were kind of being put in a lot of uh, danger because of that. Um, I think we're in a much different place now, but I think the the problems have been highlighted that I think they need much more support. Um, and I think there are has been a lot of um, good that has come out of this shift in the education system. And I wonder what things we can put in place to to continue to support educators moving forward. I think to go back to something that was mentioned earlier in the in the, 
in, in the round table was that um, uh, COVID has brought up the need for more social, emotional support and wellness within schools. And I think what I've seen is teachers um, saying that things were already difficult before COVID and that there were challenges before, but now they are faced with um, even more challenges, as you say, but also no psychosocial support at all from schools. One, because schools don't know how to do this. The schools that we work in are very under-resourced. Um, some people had never even heard of psychosocial support before COVID. And so I think we, I think practically there just needs to be spaces created um, for, for teachers to be able to, to I mean, talk and, and receive, I think, um, support in, in, in some way that I think is, will be quicker than trying to um, implement things such as um, um, the remuneration in terms of that, because we, I think we all know that teachers should be paid more. My mom was a teacher, so I, I think teachers should always, teachers are great. Um, they should be um, 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 given more in terms of, of, of the kind of work they do. But I think working in terms of the situation now and priorities moving forward is teacher well-being. And I think um, just highlighting that as something that we talk about more. Um, I don't know about um, the uh, other countries, but in South Africa, mental health um, ha has had a stigma around it because you know people don't want to say out loud that they suffer with certain things because it, it's not seen as as something because you can't see it. It's not taken seriously, or it's, it's, it's just, there's just a stigma around it. And I think this time has enabled that conversation to come up and I think we need to just create spaces as the department and perhaps working with NGOs um, that provide psychosocial support and creating even within government and um, other departments of health um, support for um, I think kids, I mean essential workers such as teachers because then I feel like that is how they'll be able to improve the teaching of the learners we we speak about so I think even the, the the five the holistic approach um, I think should be also thought about in the context of teachers um their cognitive skills their creative skills their physical um social and emotional skills because a lot of the times in 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 in, in, in public schools some teachers don't even have these skills or don't even know how to teach them so if they don't know how can they implement them so I think um, psychosocial well-being really should be something that's taken seriously moving forward, and I think practically, we, it's something that 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 is possible. Yeah, Colossa. <laughs> Anyone want to add some 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 insight or oh, sorry? Yeah, um, thank you for all the contributions and all you know, the insights. Um, I'm in the high education sector in the American Midwest, and um, I can only echo with most of the people sitting in this round table. Um, with us, it's like um, quite a few people don't take it seriously right now. And um, especially in education, we see a lot of people innovating and being creative meaning that they, they find their own way of you know, like, um, managing the classroom. The, it's very interesting, I mean, I see. Um, what they do is basically, like in many countries, they get resources, resources from the government, but they also make sure that you know, like, they, they have a safe, you know, the, um, productive classroom, if, either if they're online or in the classroom. And what some of my friends did is basically they, they looked at um one one of my friends looked at airline seating arrangements because that was one of the first things, one of the first industries that, that really hit hard. They wanted to go back on their feet and they, they, they actually looked at what kind of safety measures they put in place, how they seat people and stuff like that in the classroom. So they looked at those kind of things and what kind of air filtration systems they have. They came up with some pretty creative ways of you know like making the classroom as safe as possible so i think in various sectors of education nowadays 
Um, it's really commendable that a lot of those educators not only go into the trenches, but also become very creative and, you know, like try to, you know, like make the best not only for themselves, but also for their students, basically, because they know um, it's very tough, especially for parents, kids being at home for so long. Um, everybody wants to get back to school. And um, if you guys have any experiences there, it would be nice to hear or share in other European countries or whatever, um, that would be nice. But thank you for your insights. Yeah. Thank you, Kristen. So I, I just want to add two more points, I mean, uh, to the discussion. The first one, we, I mean, thank for Naden when you mentioned that, I mean, it seems like we talk about the emotional learning more and more than ever, right? I mean, we know it is very important, but now we can see it's a very clear, there's a crisis on, on that. And it had a very bad impact on the kids when they stay home for extended period. So the problem come back to the core of the education. Usually, if you don't evaluate or access it, right? You don't have the way to access it. The teacher does simply make it, I mean, they just simply ignore it when they, they're teaching. So I think it's very close uh, related to the new way of assessment for the breadth of the skills. And, I mean, another topic that we, we mentioned already. And I think one of the, the key things is not only for any country, I mean, all of the country, so invest more on the assessment and evaluation not only on the content, not only about the knowledge, uh, they should about the competency, their skill, the emotional learning and, and, and so on. It should be very important. And uh, the second point I want to mention is the ob observation uh, based on many different case study of, uh, of, of other countries. We can see that the education system, the, uh, the way they cope with the COVID-19 depends a lot on how they invest on education before in the past. The more you invest, the better education system. And you can, I mean, ready to cope with the pandemic, with the crisis and so on. So the point is how we can mobilize the resource, how we can, I mean, bring in more invest on, on the education is very important. Especially, I mean, after the COVID, when all of the government expenditures will be cut down. I mean, they will have the, the bad impact already. So it will be cut down. And even many of the country, they can ensure the 20% of the public expenditures for the public education. It is not the same number, the absolute number will be, will be lower. So it will be the very big issue for, I mean, from the, the top level of the government when they saw the commitment, I mean, to the, the education, it will be also have a very, very I mean, big uh, impact on, on that. And especially for the developing country like, like Vietnam, for example. I mean, we try to commit for the 20% of the public expenditure for education, but we can keep about around 17 to 18% annually. And now when the absolute number reduce, it will be a problem arise. Yeah, I just want to add to two more points. And I don't know, Colosa, you want to say something to close the round table? I think it's time for us to come back to the main session. Um, yes, I I don't have a lot to say to close, but I just think we just need to continue to prioritize bridging the gaps of, of in, inequality in terms of how they've manifested. Um, in, in the pandemic, it's, it's now we have an even bigger job than we did before, I think across um, across all countries in the world. Um, and just to also ensure that the learners are prioritized in our policy making, in our research, um, in our decision making, because this will have lifelong um, impacts in terms of um, educational att attainment and um, labor market performance. In, and that will affect, um, I think, the socioeconomic context of not only our individual countries, but of the world. Um, so thank you for attending the round table. Thank you all for your participation. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you all for joining I mean, the, the discussion.